thank Bansi and the organizers for inviting me over here. And to be very honest, sir, you've made my job much simpler. Sir has already started the entire session by telling us that basically all the evidence, initial evidence which came in was from epidemiological studies. Before I actually start telling you about why glycemic control is not that important, one fact which I want to reiterate is that mind you, I am not questioning the fact that cardiovascular disorders are more common in our diabetic patients. Okay, I am accepting that fact. What I am saying is, are we being very glucocentric? Is it that our training or what we've always learned as people, as clinicians dealing with diabetes day in and day out, even the definition of diabetes, we're all the time talking about glucose, glucose, glucose. Are we right in doing that? That is what I am going to refute today. There is little argument that diabetes reduces microvascular complications. I am not questioning that at all. What I am questioning that is do we have evidence that it also reduces microvascular complications? And in a scenario, the reason we are having this debate is because we do not have enough evidence. The bottom line is we really don't have evidence. And in a scenario like that, you are on the contrary creating a situation where you are subjecting this patient of yours just because you are being dogmatic. You want an HbA1c say of 6.5 or you want an HbA1c of say of 7. Because of that dogmatic attitude, what we are doing is creating a situation where your patient on the contrary is at increased risk of hypoglycemia. Your patient is at the, on the contrary at increased risk of weight gain. You are creating more and more complications possibly when you are really not sure what you are out to achieve also. At the same time, now we are in a scenario where all our bodies say design therapy according to your patient's requirement. We are talking about individualizing therapy. Are we really individualizing therapy when we are just saying no, this is what we want and this is what we will want to do? So are we really missing the forest for the trees is what I want to talk about. The UKPDS, you cannot have a conversation like this without talking about the UKPDS. It is simply impossible. UKPDS, as we all know, was a trial in which it was it was the basic endpoints were any diabetes related endpoint, diabetes related death or all cause mortality. I will not go into the further details, but what I want to really put across over here, if you look at this, you would see that there is no real difference as far as your cardiovascular events are concerned as far as the UKPDS goes. If you look at the data still more carefully of UKPDS, what you will see is if you look just at this data, this is the data which is seen when the patient's HB1C is relatively almost in the normal range. Even in that group, you find that there is an increased risk of myocardial infarction. Now, why is it? As doctor was saying, that the reason this happens is because we need to understand our diabetic patients are not only, we are not talking only in terms of blood sugar. These patients have a multitude of problems, dyslipidemia, hypertension, weight issues, genetics. If you look at all this, you would realize that there is almost a two-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease even in a patient with impaired glucose tolerance. What are we actually talking about? You will see that patients, newly diagnosed patients already have vascular disease at presentation. We are talking about clinical scenarios like this. This is what we are actually talking about. Is it that actually because diabetes is actually an inflammation, disorder of inflammation, because it is actually a vascular disease, Maybe we really to rethink what exactly we are treating when we are talking in terms of diabetes. The critics of course said that no, no benefits, underpowered, too late, okay, fair enough. I will talk about the next evidence that we have. What about the accord? A trial which I am sure changed the thinking of a lot of people sitting in this room including mine. What actually was the result of the accord? I am sure everybody knows what I have put up over here so I am not going to go into the details of this. What I need to under tell you, understand is the non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke or death from CV causes of what was the result required. And if you look at the primary outcome, this is the primary outcome, standard therapy, intensive therapy, no real benefit. If you look at the death from any cause, again intensive therapy, standard therapy, no benefit. Actually, Accord in a big way gave us further evidence regarding the U-shaped curve. We always knew somewhere on the line that there was a U-shaped curve and we need to look at it a little more carefully. Now we have more and more evidence which says, yes, a very low HbA1c and a very high HbA1c both are harmful. In this entire conversation that I am having with you, I am not trying to undermine the importance of glycemia, mind you. 
I am saying that it is not the factor which really makes a major difference as far as cardiovascular disorders go. Okay, you say no benefit in accord. What about advance? Again, another major trial which all of us are well aware of. I mean, I don't need to go into this, but what I need to tell you is death from CV causes non fatal MI. You talk about non fatal stroke. What do you see? You think that I am copy pasting the prior slides. I am not. This is advanced data. If you look at further data, this is again death from any cause. Again, if you look at both standard and intensive control, this is the kind of data we have been seeing all along. We cannot totally negate RCTs and say, okay, no, we need to find out why this has happened. And yes, I agree that we need to find why this has happened. If we say no, I the critics said that in advance, what we saw was an annual rate of only 2.2% which was lower than what we expected. We were expecting 3%. But this could possibly be because of all this. Statins, BP lowering agents, anti agents. This is what was changing the scenario of, of advance. And that's what we need to keep in mind and that's what I'm going to reiterate. Again, back, similar things, similar data, which I will not go into the gross details about. But what I really want to put across to this audience today is that maybe we need to think rethink somewhere. Maybe we are wrong in our thinking because what we need to realize is that if you look at atherosclerosis, glucose plays an important role in lesion initiation whereas lipids play a more dominant role in lesion progression. I think we need to look at this data more carefully because we need to understand that the beneficial effects of lipid lowering in subjects with established type 2 diabetes is absolutely clear and the lipids are likely to play a more important role than glucose. Maybe that could answer our question, the open-ended question about what exactly is benefiting these patients. We love our, we love our meta, meta analysis, we love our systematic reviews. Similar data from systematic reviews, the BMJ said that intensive glycemic control does not seem to reduce all-cause mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes. A very, very categorical statement put across. And they again said that data does not show that it is the all that we have only glycemic control is beneficial as far as cardiovascular mortality is concerned and non-fatal MI is concerned. Again, data which we need to look across very, very carefully. But what this does, as I told you right at the beginning, what this is doing is increasing your risk of hypoglycemia. Think, are you justified in doing that? Do you have sufficient evidence to do that? I really don't think so. I think we need to rethink as to whether we have the evidence to be able to create a situation where you are actually going to do harm to your patient rather than benefit. Similar data, so basically what we conclude as to some extent at least as of now is that you have a further improvement of 1 millimole per liter LDL reduction results in 8.2% reduction of cardiovascular events and a 4 millimeter mercury of blood pressure reduction results in 12.5 cardiovascular events being reduced. So the benefit from glycemic control is modest. It is modest compared to control of lipids and blood pressure. So coming to the multi-million dollar question, what all started this? Is glucose control important for prevention of cardiovascular disease and diabetes? This is your diabetes care, August 2013, which tells you that the role of non-glycemic factors that accompany type 2 diabetes is much better understood. And it seems to be, mind you, independent of glycemia. A very, very important thing, the point which I want to put across is that it is independent of glycemia. And at the other end they say, on contrast to date, the positive effect of intensive glucose management in comparison with non-intensive glucose control on CVD outcomes is still far from proven. Keep this in mind, but this I think is a very, very important message being given to us. And I think one of the reasons this happens is because we need to understand that cardiovascular disease and diabetes is not only glucose mediated. It's a multifactorial disease. It is all these things which play a very important role. Dyslipidemia, hypertension, platelets, your, of course your glycemia. So it's a picture in total. And now we have more and more papers coming out as to say whether it is inflammation which would actually explain to you what exactly is going wrong. Whether that could be the reason why we have all these issues arising in the first place. And whether lifestyle, exercise and weight reduction would actually be important. As the last two minutes in which I will just talk on, about a minute on steno 2 because I think it's a very interesting track from the fact that it really gives you an insight into how multifactorial intervention and cardiovascular disease works in patients with type 2 diabetes. If you look at this, what you would see is that in patients who are on the conventional arm and the intensive arm, this is your intensive arm. 
and in these patients there is a reduction of almost 53% relative risk reduction in these patients. And what does this actually mean? If you look back at this slide, you would see that actually the difference in the HbA1c is only 0.6. It is these factors, you know, if you look at this, the cholesterol, the Tg, the BP, it is these factors which are making a major difference. So, uh, without undermining what I am saying, don't go absolutely blinded. No, I want an HbA1c of so much because I don't think getting that HbA1c where you think you are going to get it is going to make as major a difference as you think it is going to. So, is glucose lowering a cardiovascular waste of time? That is again a question which I will leave for you to ponder. But yes, what I want to tell you is intensive glucose lowering with complex regimens in patients with established diabetes is unlikely to have a short term cardiovascular benefit and actually you may be doing more harm than good to your patients and as a clinician, whatever you may do, we have no right to do harm to our patients. And what the second most important take home point which I want to put across is that multifactorial risk reduction is what is required. What is the requirement of the R is multifactorial risk reduction. What is the requirement is tailoring your patient's treatment according to what the patients require. And what is the need of the R is having an informed discussion with the patient and seeing to it that you are not causing any deterioration in the quality of life. You finally want to give this patient a good quality of life. At what cost? I mean, are you justified in doing this? And, to, and this all you need to understand is that we continue to struggle against lifestyle that lead to cardiovascular disease and the largest gains will be potentially achieved with lifestyle. And to conclude, when the facts change, I change my mind. What about you? Thank you very much.